Now we are we are in a city mood and uh, yeah I think we can continue with that too because what we see now in cities that there is a lot of buildings that are empty and uh, all morning we've been talking about food production so why don't we connect up the two and that's exactly what John Apesos is going to do he's a lead expert with an academic background in history ecology and business and he came to the Netherlands in 2007 to attend <coughs> the Rotterdam School of Management following five years working in leadership development, environmental and social non-for-profit organizations. And he worked in uh, clean tech entrepreneurship uh, in several companies and uh, in several areas uh, in, um, in the world. And now he's tackling climate change via this urban agriculture in Amsterdam. And he spoke at TEDx uh, Amsterdam uh, 2011 where he won the TEDx Amsterdam Ideas Worth Doing Award. And he works closely with the Amsterdam municipality, uh, the innovation motor, uh, other innovators that really want uh, to innovate uh, the urban food supply system. I think that's, that's really creative, that kind of thing. You see what we need in these cities and, and it's all happening. And in cities you also have the creativity of all the people connecting. So it, it, it must come from the cities. Now what he will uh, talk about is that the uh, sustainable solution to the issue of food miles is to change to local production for local consumption. L for L, I, I like that. So it's the uh, local production for local consumption food supply system. John, the floor is yours. So today, I'm going to speak to you a little bit about what I see as the future of farming. Now, my background is a little bit of a serial entrepreneur, but for a long time, I was an outdoor professional. And in this slide here, you can see me with one of my clients. I have the big bag. Uh, and we're in Torres de Paine, and basically overlooking the beautiful Glacier Gray. And I'm probably going to give him a small talk on hydrology and, and that type of thing. Now, when you're responsible for a group or a team in the outdoors, there's only a couple of things that can really go seriously wrong. But one of the most important things to do is to plan an expedition around water. This is, it doesn't matter when, uh, where, how you do it, but you need to either carry with you enough fresh water um, if you're in a boat, or you need to be able to get access to fresh water um, if you're going through the mountains. It remains constant. And you basically need to get to that water source uh, one time uh, per day. So this is really important for groups who are in the wilderness, but it's equally important for society in general. So how much water is there? I like this image because it's a, there's a sphere of the Earth next to a sphere of all the water that is on Earth. Now, when you look at that sphere, it's important to remember 97% of that water is seawater. And then with the amount of fresh water that's there, a lot of it's in the aquifers, a lot of it's stored in ice, and then you have the surface water in the, the lakes and the river. And I'm here to question, is water a renewable resource? When I look at it with this image, I come to the conclusion of no, because we're on a finite planet with a finite amount of water on it. But when I think about the world as I've seen it, as I experienced it, I come to the conclusion, yes, because water goes up, water goes down, and it seems to always come back, and I've never personally had a major water shortage um, in my life, although there are people who live under water stress. Excuse me. So in that sense, I don't consider water a renewable resource only because if the water cycle breaks down, then the water cycle breaks down. And this got me interested in hydroponics. Now, hydroponics literally means working water, which I like. Now, this is a way of growing food which uses 90% less water than field agriculture, which I also like. Now, there's a lot of confusion around hydroponics. We have a hydroponics uh, industry uh, that's thriving right now in the glass houses, in the Veslan, and here in the Netherlands. There's 20,000 hectares of greenhouses in operation. There's also a dirty side to hydroponics. It's also used to grow drugs inside, also done here. So there's a, 
sort of what I call the, the nuclear uh, question. You can enrich uranium for bombs. You can enrich uranium for energy. The same thing with hydroponics. And a lot of people don't know that you can grow food in a really effective way with it. So this got me to try something. Agriculture anywhere. Excuse me. Uh, agriculture anywhere. By building this two, uh, this two square meter kit, we could grow about 105 plants in a month, which is more than most households or offices would need, uh, under LED lighting. Now, I was first introduced to LED uh, horticultural technology when I worked at Lemnus Lighting. And they were one of the pioneering companies uh, in this type of technology. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with horticulture, and for those of you who aren't familiar with LED, this is OK. You're probably saying, what's with the purple light? Well, simple. You have green plants. And they're green because they reflect green light. So what some of the innovators here in the Netherlands did was they started to work with the specific wavelengths that plants needed for the most effective growth. So this is, when you use the full spectrum, white light, that's like a jackhammer, really powerful. When you use LED light, it's like a scalpel, really precise. And there's, they're, they're more energy efficient. So by running through this experiment, this was really exciting for me. Now, unfortunately, I do live in reality. And I've spoken to a lot of people in industry and said, listen, I, I, I want to roll this out. We're gonna, this, is good, this is going to be a good thing. John, son, <laughs> you don't understand. This is never going to work, which makes an entrepreneur's blood boil. but you still have to listen to it. Well, why not? Well, the sun is free. The sun is free. The sun is free is the guiding principle of agriculture. It is the reason, it is the sun fundamental paradigm of why we use 60 times more land mass than suburban and, uh, sur suburban and urban areas combined for our food. Our Societal footprint is so large based on this paradigm of the sun is free. And I cannot argue against it. And this pains me. So I concede the sun is free. But sucking all the water out of the ground is not free. The petrochemicals and the runoff that goes down into our soil, that is not free either. And the congestion and the long haul transport and the supply chain and food traveling 1,200 miles, no, that is not free. So we're back on the table. <laughs> I do think that there will be a business case here, but I think there's going to be more of a value case. And you need to be open to, which I think most of the people here are, to basically access to fresh food. My slides keep going forward, sorry. Um, access to fresh food, uh, getting people closer to agriculture, getting people closer to efficiency. Um, I like what I'm doing. But I also like the community gardens, the rooftop gardens. I support it all. Uh, I'm not dogmatic or religious in my thinking. I don't think that there's a single solution. Um, those who convince you of a single solution uh, probably have an agenda. Um, I don't. Um, so this is the, after three uh, design iterations, I've come together with this kit here. And by using uh, basically a very simple modular kit, you can grow food modularly, thus you have sort of, of a garden effect. Um, so you can harvest like a garden instead of the large monocultures. Um, I'm a big fan of the, the next speaker, actually, Eva. Uh, she talks a lot about her, her polydome or using a polyculture. Uh, what I've seen from my experience in the, uh, in the outdoors is the uh, ecological niche is very important. So when you, sometimes a really beautiful garden or a really great farm takes advantage of creating ecological niche. And oh, keeps on going on. that's what I'd like to do with these kits one at a time. And I really want to invite others to try to experiment with this technology and see what they think and see how it goes for them. There we go. And this is what it looks like at scale. Um, you know, wh when you're an entrepreneur, you start with one and then you go to two and to three and four. And this is basically a rendition of the shell tower 
And we did a couple different, uh, I did a couple of renditions with uh, an architectural company of how could you maximize the space here. And it's about 480 square meters in there. And we can maximize that to uh, 235 square meters per layer of growing area. So in different points in the actual uh, production of the, of the plants, um, they will be at different heights. Thus, they need to be at different distances from their light sources uh, without getting too far into that. But the idea here is being able to roll, some out, roll something out quickly. While I do support uh, building in actual infrastructure where we can do long-term growing inside of cities, what worries me the most, what frightens me, is uh, that you can't roll it out so quickly. Building huge structures takes time. Um, I do want to see the vertical tower greenhouses. I would love to see them in every single city. But I haven't seen the political or the financial will over the last 10 years to produce these things. So it's, it's time to get moving. You have to try a couple different solutions. And again, I don't think that there'll be a single one. OK, I'll live with that. So it's time to get going. And I want to let you know what it feels like when you're in this process, when you, when you put yourself out there. I get kind of tired of conferences sometimes, because we do know the, the answers. And ironically, I'm saying this at a conference. But um, you know, it, it, we do know what some of the issues are. But what's so difficult, sometimes we, we over plan or we, we overthink. And I have a very American entrepreneurial way to look at these things. You basically need to move things into the market. You need to try them. And you need to fail fast and come up with new solutions. So I really want to invite people to get out there, um, to work with food, to fail fast, to build communities around it, and to, to try solutions, even if they may be as crazy as, let's fill up empty offices with LED lights and hydroponics. Because it's not necessarily a great business case, but I think it's a good value case. Thanks for your time. Yes. Wonderful talk. Absolutely wonderful job. It, because it's daring to do it, basically. And it, I sometimes think you should be like a butterfly that just goes there and samples a bit, and then you know just don't be afraid of uh, of failing uh, failing uh, your business. And uh, I think that's what you've shown us. Well, now, I'm afraid. Holland is terrible <laughs> in that. Yeah, I know you're afraid, maybe, but you do it anyway. <laughs> And I think Holland is very different from the United States in that respect. We, mm. don't, we, we try to innovate without any uh, risk, and that's totally impossible. It, so it, it is impossible. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is impossible. Uh, I, was, I was speaking with somebody who uh, was running the, the sustainability manager for the uh, Dutch uh, uh, national park system, and they were trying to roll out some solutions. And look, you do get that lock solid business plan. It, it, this is going to work like this, and the technology is yeah, proven yeah, and proven. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, when we implemented, we ran into these problems. And you are to expect problems in implementation. So try to move through the plan okay, faster. OK, good lesson. I'm Thank going you. to throw you off stage. And uh, I, I really like it. You, you don't get no for an answer. That's probably uh, another good one that you have Thank learned. You. Thanks very much. We're going to go on.